There was once a rich man that lived in the countryside. He had a lot of land and a lot of money, but he had no wife. You see, he had a hard time approaching women because they were weirded out by his blue beard. Women were also reluctant to become involved with him because he had been married multiple times. He approached a local woman to ask about marrying one of her daughters. The daughters were not interested in him due to his blue beard and his bad reputation. He told them he could change their mind. The whole family and their friends should come to his estate for a fun weekend. And a fun weekend they did have. They were impressed by his big house, great food, and beautiful land. The younger daughter decided she could work with the blue. She and the blue bearded man were soon married. Not long after, he needed to go away on a business trip. He gave her the keys to the room where he kept his fine food, the room where he kept all his money, and even the one where he kept his jewels and art. He also gave her one more small key. He said that it opened the door to the closet in the hall. He also said that she should not open that one, and if she did, it would be the worst mistake she has ever made. Bluebeard left the next day and his wife's sister went to the house to keep her company. Her brothers would come by the next day as they hadn't gotten to see the house yet due to their obligations as members of the country's military. The wife and her sister were having a lot of fun with the whole estate to themselves, but the wife couldn't stop thinking about the closet in the hallway. What could her new husband be hiding in there? After her sister went to bed, the wife took the small key off the ring and went to open the closet. She excitedly opened the door and took a few steps in. It was dark, and it took a moment for her eyes to adjust to see what was inside. When they did, she saw the heads of multiple women in varying states of decay on the shelves of the room. In her shock, she dropped the key on the dusty floor. She ran out of the room and closed the door. She ran up to her bed to try and forget what she had seen. That next morning, her husband returned home. They greeted each other, and she tried to just act normal, not knowing what to do about her situation. A little while after, he came to her and asked why the closet key wasn't on the key ring. She said it must have fallen off. He asked, then why were your footprints in there? He grabbed her by the hair and started dragging her to where he kept his sword. She pleaded with him not to kill her. He said he had to now. She said, well, at least let me pray first. He told her she had 15 minutes. She ran to her sister and took her to the top of the tallest tower in the estate. She told her that Bluebeard was going to kill her and asked her sister to flag down a passerby or their brothers for help. Bluebeard began banging on the door, saying that it was time. The wife came out willingly in an attempt to protect her sister. Bluebeard began dragging her to the courtyard, along with his sword. She began pleading with him again, trying to buy any time. When they got to the courtyard, he threw her to the ground and said that this is the end. Then they heard a banging at the gate. And then the sound of two horses. It was her brothers. The sister had already yelled to them what was going on. Bluebeard began to run, but her brothers ran him down and cut off his head. Bluebeard had no heirs, so all of his wealth and property went to his new widow. She used her new wealth to find a wealthy husband for her sister and to help her brothers get promoted. She also used it to find a new husband, with hopes of him helping her to forget the last one. There are many different versions of this story. The first written version of Bluebeard came from a wealthy Frenchman named Charles Perrault in 1697. The book the story was published in was called Tales and Stories of the Past with Morals. Today we usually call it by its subtitle, The Tales of Mother Goose. Unlike the other stories in the book, like Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, Little Red Riding Hood, and Puss in Boots, no one has figured out how to sanitize Bluebeard enough to make it into a popular children's movie. It is the first version to be printed, but like many other stories in his book, it was an existing story that he modernized and added his style to. I don't think he would complain that I did the same for this video to make the story easier to tell, especially considering there are dozens if not hundreds of other versions already. Like many folk tales, Bluebeard is believed to have at least been partially inspired by real life events. The two men most commonly believed to have inspired the story both lived in northwestern France, where the story is believed to have originated. Our first inspiration was a man named King Connemore, who is believed to have ruled in modern-day Brittany. He is also called King Connemore the Cursed or King Connemore the Accursed. Connemore is believed to have been born in 460 AD and ruled as the Prince of Poer and later the King of Domnonia. The accounts we do have of Connemore are heavily mixed with folklore, but what seems likely to be true is that Connemore consolidated a large area under his rule by conquest and by marriage. The story says that he acquired Demnonia by killing its king Jonas. He then married Jonas's widow. He treated her and her son well till she told him about a dream she had. In it, she saw all the kings of Brittany paying homage to her son as he sat on a mountain. Connemore took this as an omen and began plotting to kill his wife and her son. The two of them were able to escape to Paris before he could though. Next, Connemore set his sights on marrying Saint Trophine. Connemore approached Trophine's father, King Waroche, asking for her hand in marriage. Her and her father were worried about her marrying Connemore due to his reputation. Fearing that Connemore would invade if they refused, a local monk known as Saint Gildas guaranteed her safety should they marry. Gildas gave her a silver ring to signify this. Things went well at first, but Connemore was paranoid because he had been told that he would be killed by his own son someday. After Trophine became pregnant, he started plotting her death. 
The silver ring St. Gildas gave her then turned black, which she saw as a warning. The next night, she went down to the royal crypt because she had heard there was an escape passage there. Down there, she saw six stone coffins, one that was empty and five that were full. Out of the five full coffins came the ghosts of Connemore's five previous wives. They came and warned Trephine of how they were killed. Trephine then ran into the woods where she saw her father's hawk. She tossed her ring to the hawk, who then brought it to her father. Seeing the ring, her father sent St. Gildas to save her. In the meantime, Connemore found Trephine in the woods and cut off her head. The hawk led St. Gildas to her body, where he began to pray. Trephine's body then sat up and reattached her own head. She went back to her father's castle and gave birth to her and Connemore's son. She named him Tremure. After this, word of Connemore's crimes got out and he was forced out of much of the land he ruled. Years later, Connemore was traveling back through his former lands and he saw a boy. He asked the boy his name and the boy said his name is Tremure. Connemore had heard that this was the name of the son he feared so much. Connemore then pulled out his sword and cut off the boy's head. As Connemore walked away from the lifeless corpse of his son, the corpse stood up and picked up his head. Tremere began taunting and chasing Connemore. He chased him all the way to Connemore's castle, where God then willed the castle to crumble upon Connemore, killing him. You can see how over the course of a thousand plus years, this could evolve into the story of Bluebeard. There are quite a few similarities. Connemore is also possibly the inspiration for two other legends. One is King Mark of Cornwall, who appears in the Arthurian legend of Tristan and Isolt. The short summary of that story is that Isolt is to marry Mark, but then she starts cheating on him with Tristan. Mark of Cornwall is often called the Cuckold King for this reason. Like every Arthurian legend, there are quite a few versions of it. I would recommend the 2006 movie Tristan and Isolt. Also like every Arthurian legend, it's pretty murky who, if anyone, it is based on. Connemore is just one candidate. Connemore may have also been the inspiration for the giant Cormoran, who was the first giant killed in the Jack and the Giant Killer story. Quite the influential fellow King Connemore was, at least as far as literature goes. He did seemingly conquer some land in his day, but not enough for us to have a lot of records on him. Most of what we have comes from him being mentioned in the book of the History of the Franks from 594, and from him appearing in the stories about the lives of the saints he is said to have interacted with. The second possible inspiration has quite a lot more written about him. He was a French noble named Gilles de Ray, who was born around 1405. His parents were from two powerful families, the House of Creon and the House of Laval. This meant that de Ray was destined to be a wealthy and powerful man and would become the Baron of Retz. His parents died when de Ray was still young, and he was largely raised by his maternal grandfather, Jean de Crayon. Jean is said to have been a cold man, but he would take de Ray out to the countryside to do pillaging raids on their own people. De Ray would go on to be very successful as a military man. He made a name for himself fighting for France in many conflicts related to the Hundred Years' War. This eventually led to him sitting on the royal council for King Charles VII of France. De Ray served as an important general for the French and often fought in the same battles as Joan of Arc, including the sieges of Orléans and Paris. This is where one of the more debated aspects of De Ray's life comes in. There's a lot of speculation as to what Gilles De Ray's relationship was to Joan of Arc. This ranges from people claiming that they didn't know each other to people claiming that they were lovers. They were at least trusted comrades since it is on record that De Ray was one of the officers she summoned to siege the Parisian gate named Port Saint Honoré. De Ray's victories in battle led to him being given the great military honor of Marshal of France. While all of this was happening, de Ray was spending a lot of money. He was building extravagant buildings, commissioning art, and maintaining his own troops. He began selling assets to cover this lifestyle in 1429, which angered his family. After some military losses that angered the king, and the death of his grandfather Jean de Crayon, de Ray began largely staying at his own estates. De Ray continued to sell property to finance his spending. After selling a castle to Geoffrey Le Ferron, the treasurer to the Duke of Brittany, de Ray tried to take it back. This culminated in de Ray kidnapping Geoffrey's brother, Jean Le Ferron, who was a priest. De Ray and a group of armed men went into a mass Jean was officiating and took him and some other officials hostage. He would take them to his castle in Tifouge. To this day, this castle is sometimes known as Chateau de Barbe Bleu, or Bluebeard's Castle. This was an act of sacrilege as well as a direct affront to the Duke of Brittany and the Bishop of Nantes, Jean de Malestois. This led to an ecclesiastical and a civil court investigation into De Ray. The bishop's investigation found many rumors in the lands de Ray ruled over of him and his servants abducting and sexually abusing children. There were also rumors of him engaging in alchemy and demon summoning. After the investigation, de Ray and several co-conspirators were accused of murdering children, sodomy, invoking demons, offending the divine majesty, and heresy. The two most important accomplices were de Ray's servants, Henriet Griard and Etienne Corlot also known as Poitou. These two provide the most important testimony in De Ray's trial. There is also an Italian priest named Francois Prelati, who supposedly helped De Ray summon a demon named Baron and tried to use alchemy to make gold to pay off his debts. The rituals used to call the demon were claimed to have included sacrificing children. 
There was also another priest named Eustache Blanchet, who Duray often entrusted with his most important affairs. This included recruiting Prelati and bringing him from Italy to Duray's estate. There aren't a lot of details as to why, but these two priests would go free after the trial. They would later kidnap Geoffrey Leferon, as they blamed him for the investigation and trial. The priest would torture Leferon for two months before he was freed. For this crime, Prelati was burned at the stake and Blanchet was banished and forced to pay compensation to Leferon. Duray's cousins, Gilles de Sille, and Roger de Breckville were accused of aiding in the killing of children, but they were believed to have gone on the run and they were never captured. The most mythologized supposed accomplices were two women named Tefane Branchu and Perenne Martin, also known as Le Mefre. Locals said that they were seen talking to children and taking them to the castle, and that the children would not be seen again. They are only mentioned in passing in the original documents and it is unknown what became of them and how real they are. De Ray, Henriet, and Poitou did not mention them in their confessions. Also, Henriet and Poitou's confessions are believed to have been made under torture. Duray's was made under threat of torture. Their confessions were the bulk of the evidence and where the details we have come from. It's also where the most obvious influence on Bluebeard's story comes from. They testified that after Duray had abused and killed the children, they would cut their heads off and keep them in a private room so Duray could continue admiring them. I'm not going to go into specifics of their actual crimes. They went into great detail of what they did in their testimonies though. Below I linked one of the better sources I found if you want more details from the trial. Several families also came forward to testify that they had entrusted their child to Gilles de Ray and that they were never seen again. The ecclesiastical trial concluded that they had killed at least 140 children. The civil court did not give a specific number. After the trial, de Ray, Henriet, and Poitou were sentenced to death. They were executed simultaneously by being hung over bonfires. After the rope was burned through, de Ray's body was pulled out of the fire and buried at a church in Nantes, which was a condition of his confession. What was left of the other two was left to nature to deal with. And that was the end of Gilles de Ray's story. Except that some people think what I just told you might not be true. All the way back to the actual time of the trial, there have been questions about its validity. There are two main reasons for this. First is that most of the evidence came from confessions extracted by torture, with little to no physical evidence. The other big reason is that there were political motives for Gilles de Ray to go away. After his death, the Duke of Brittany was able to seize de Ray's assets. The trial was also abnormally quick, possibly to avoid Charles VII from interfering. A few years after the trial, Charles even wrote a letter saying that the trial was politically motivated when trying to give de Ray's property back to his widow. De Ray's innocence was never proven though. Since then, many have questioned his guilt ranging from Voltaire to Aleister Crowley to modern medievalists. I would agree with the larger consensus, however. Although there are questions about some of the testimony, there was enough to think that Gilles de Ray was more than likely a serial killer before the term existed. The number of how many he killed ranges from dozens to 600, and I don't think we will ever be confident on what the true number is. I would also agree with some that say that he may have never been caught if he hadn't run afoul of the Duke of Brittany. It was fairly rare for nobles to actually face any sort of real punishment for what they did to commoners. It also seems likely that the Duke pushed for a speedy trial. For better or for worse, what is definitely true is that Gilles de Ray has impacted culture beyond being an inspiration for Bluebeard. He has appeared in numerous works of art and will likely be continued to be talked about long after we are dead. That is all I have for you. I hope you have a great day and eat something good.